we're going to, in this video and in this podcast, we're going to talk about what if you knew what a consumer or a client wants at any given minute? How would you like to have that access? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome to the Ugly Truth About Sales podcast, producing live out of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, by, hosted by me, Victor Orocho. This, co- this podcast is about sales reality, perception, execution, and the hollow statements that entrepreneurs, CEOs, and people make. We discuss how to get past these ugly truths by taking action. We interview successful entrepreneurs, executives, and sales professionals who share their experiences about how they've succeeded by following best practices in growing their business and the business of others. So if you haven't yet, please um, follow me on Twitter at V. Arocho, that's A-R-O-C-H-O, V for Victor, or YouTube, search Victor Arocho, A-R-O-C-H-O, and my website's victorarocho.com. Lots of resources, all the podcasts are there. We'll be rebroadcasting this. So hopefully, uh, you know, our goal is to get and transform as many um, entrepreneurs and executives in the realm of sales today so they can grow their revenues uh, exponentially and leave their their client or their competition behind. Today, we're very fortunate. Our guest host is David Finkelstein. He is a serial entrepreneur, founder of numerous internet companies dating back to 1994. He founded National Internet Source Inc. in 1994, and in the year 2000, he sold it to U.S. Cable Corporation. He's also the founder of Context You Ads. Did I say that right? Yep. Context You Ads, freeairmiles.com, Triple Jack, and Dynaprice. David is responsible for all the day to day operations of what he's doing today at BDEX. He has a passion for all things data, enjoys time, tennis, kayaking, the beach. We're from Miami, Fort Lauderdale, so we got to love the beach. And spending time with his family. He's a member of the Entrepreneurs Organization, eonetwork.org, for several years. And we're really happy to have you on our show today, David. Um, And the one thing I want to leave is amongst his peers, they've appointed him the title of Internet Pioneer and tech entrepreneur. So I just want to get that out. That's what uh, a lot of his peers call him. So it's pretty good. David's a great guy. So Dave, uh, David, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you having you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Victor. Thank you. Happy to be here. No, oh, Awesome. So I, I see a lot of success that you're having in, in the internet space. And um, that's where we want to get to uh, and discuss. You, I think uh, we're going to talk about BDEX today. Right. And we're going to ask you some questions and just help us out. And then we're going to tell the audience a little bit about what BDEX does and how they can get a hold of you and your company. We good? Yep. All right. Absolutely. Great. So um, the show is about the, the misconceptions. So what, mis- what misunderstandings or misconceptions do the people or the sales leaders and CEOs that you deal with have about targeting the right clients that fit their solutions or customers that fit their solutions? Yeah, I love this question because most people don't realize it, but the data that's made available to them by media companies and everybody's, you know, using a wide range of media companies. It could be anything from Facebook to, you know, to a big advertising agency um, to run your media. Their misconception is that the data that they're using is there to serve their best interests. Right. And actually, it's there to serve the media company's best interests. And so I'll give you a great example. I see this all the time. We work with a lot of you know really big data companies, some of the largest. And uh, without naming specific names, you know, we do a lot of analysis of their data. 
So for example, someone might send us, uh, we might find an audience available to target consumers that are looking to buy a new car. And the typical audience of that, uh, uh, of that nature that you'll find online in a media platform where a company like GM or Ford or Lexus might be advertising to could be as many as 10 million people in that audience. Wow. And the reality is only a maximum of maybe a million new cars are sold each month. So where's this 10 million number coming from, right? And the way that they look at it is it's very similar to, you know, what has gone on for many, many years in the TV industry, right? You're advertising to millions upon millions of people. And in that, in that big audience of millions of people, there are people that are going to buy a new car in the next month. So what happens is by advertising to more people, the media companies make more money. So the, what we're learning and what we're trying to educate our customers on is that they're being forced to advertise to a huge, huge audience of people when the actual potential customer within that is maybe 10% of that entire audience. So that's a big misconception and, and, and it's misleading a lot of sales leaders and they're spending a lot of money on marketing uh, to a big audience when really the true audience that way they want to reach is much smaller. So um, if I understand you right, because I know a little bit about, you know, the uh, media advertising, they sell on impressions, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, they care about, look, we have a million readers or we have a, a people that watch our show. There's 10 million of them. Um, here's the data. And what I'm hearing you say is that they're not targeting enough. Yeah. Right. They're yeah. not isolating. They're, they're not doing what I call a surgical approach. It's not in their best interest because like you said, they get paid per impression. So the more people they advertise to, the more money they make. Interesting. Uh, one thing that I, want to, I wanted to share with you so you could say it, and, I, and we talked a little bit earlier, that's a perfect example that you, your company is analyzing their data so they can market to the best client possible at any given time correct so yeah. out of the 10 million you're going to isolate that data to whatever percentage of it and say this is the low-hanging fruit stay surgical on this and, and and you'll generate you'll generate more revenue with a more surgical approach of people who are really interested not just seeing something yeah that that's that yeah absolutely that's our goal is to help help our customers find that that sort of niche target consumer that uh, we say is the right reaching the right people at the right time. So would you agree with, you know, my statement that I, t and I have tons of them, but you know, the statement is you can't manage what you can't measure. Right. So would it be fair yeah. to when people are looking, whoever it is, we're not naming anyone particular, but when people are looking at it, this access of 10 million data points and they're not really managing it, in the manner that your company does, how it's impossible from really for them to measure it. Yeah. Right? And it is costly. It's costly. They may be getting, a, and here's, here's an interesting piece that I hear, particularly in sales where people get compl get complacent, right? They may be making money. They think because of the advertising and they may get a return on investment, but really what's happening is, and correct me if I'm wrong, they're overpaying so their return could be a lot higher than it is. So yeah. they either have two choices. You want to get a higher return on your money or do you want to stay complacent and be happy with a much smaller return on your money is that, yeah. is that, or investment? Is that correct? Exactly. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. So I would agree with that. And again, hollow statements, can't manage what you can't measure start measuring it or hire a company that's going to measure that data for you have the same problem with companies and clients of ours and sales executives that are not utilizing their CRM for data. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, so uh, how, how do you, how have you communicated? I know how you solve the problems of your client. I mean, based on what you told me a little bit, we'll get into that a little bit deeper, but how do you solve some of that mis uh, uh, per perception of, of a client when you go to, well, you know, uh, I'm already, yeah, I, I'm spending money. I get 10 million uh, views. I get 10 million eyeballs. Mm -hmm. You know, why, you know, why would I do something else? That's working for me. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, at the end of the day, their mindset is still stuck in that piece, not 
the surgical piece. And that's the sad part about it is all the great large companies are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, they let Facebook, Amazon, I mean, you know, they didn't make any money. Now they got the, you know, Facebook's got access to a lot of data. Mm -hmm. So you sit with someone that says, Oh, you know, I'm doing pretty good. And obviously you don't want to work with someone who doesn't want to work, but you still got to get past that making sure they understand. So how do you get past that? I guess, you know, I don't want to keep going. Yeah. I mean, from our, our perspective, we, uh, we typically, because we have access to so much data, what we'll typically do is, is demonstrate it. So we'll, we can have the ability to do a data analysis and re show them a report that helps them, um, that really just demonstrates how we identify the right people at the right time for them um, in ways that, you know, whoever they're using, whatever platform they're using, whatever data they're using, just can't. And so we, you know, we demonstrate it, you know, we physically show them, um, typically we'll show them a report for another customer that we've done that goes through that entire analysis. And once they see that analysis, they're like, wow, you know, we're not doing that. And then they realize that because they're not doing that, they're not targeting the right people. And it starts What's to set that? in. What's the that? The that is the analysis, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, you're not managing the data, right? You're just accepting it for what it is and just saying, okay, well, these guys are targeting my ads. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to accept it and wherever it's going, it's going and it's converting and I'm getting this ROI. And I've always gotten that ROI. It's, it's, you know, the typical, it, it's always worked. So why change it? Right. But if, if companies live like that, you know, the companies that do live that like that, you know, turn into Kodak, right. You know, they just disappear. Oh, we um, you, you have more some buggies. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to change, you have to change with time. So, you know, making the customer realize that what has worked in the past is not going to work in the future. You have to change with the times and you have to realize that we're in a data economy and with more and more data available, you know, if you're not using it, you're falling behind. So we demonstrate that by showing them an analysis of what we would do for, for them, what we've done for other customers and, uh, and how that analysis has helped that customer outperform. Interesting. How I look at it, you know, when I, I have a, a podcast every Friday, we released uh, with one of my mentors who's uh, founded the chapter in New Jersey um, in 1987, EO, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm an entrepreneur's organization as well. That's how we know each other. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing he said to me that I thought was interesting, what you're saying is, I believe people were doing what you were doing uh, in the past is just now the vehicles and the tools have changed. Mm -hmm. The good ones, right? Yeah. Because they would analyze, I mean, you think about it, insurance companies have been around for a long time and the big ones had to analyze their data, right? Yep. Um, you have some of uh, the, uh, just the other larger companies that were managing the data. Where I see is the small and medium sized business or the entrepreneurs that, that for some reason, when it comes to any of the aspects of sales, um, I always say that everyone manages or, or will review processes and, and systems and efficiencies and sales is the only place where it doesn't get audited. Right. Enough. So, yeah. Yeah, they absolutely. They, they don't, they don't do an audit. They'll audit yeah. their systems or audit their accounting. Um, but they won't audit the sales functionality, the, the returns, the, mm -hmm. how can we improve? Right. And, yeah. um, how should a company, you know, so based on your, uh, your piece, and I don't know if this question and you tell me, how should a company start building a target client po profile, right? So yeah. when they come to you, are you building it based on you pulling the data or are you also saying, Hey, who's you, who do you really want? Cause sometimes they think they want this type of person, right? And that's not the most profitable person, right? Even yeah. you're getting 10 million views, you've isolated to 2 million and that 2 million is generating four times the money. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I, I, I had that exact cus uh, call with a customer literally an hour ago um, because they have the perception that they want to sell their product to, you know, 20 somethings. But the reality is their customers are 40 somethings, you know, and that's just, that's who their customer is. So they're, They've been spending all this money advertising to the wrong audience. 
And how do we figure that out? It's great. You know, that, that, that's one of the things that a lot of companies don't even realize because they don't look at their own data. So the first thing I always say uh, for a company is to get to know your customers as well as possible. How do you get to know your customers? Well, you know, you got to know what drives them to become your customer, what behaviors or intents identify that they'll become a customer. Um, not just demographics. I mean, we can all look at demographics and look at the age and gender and all that stuff. But there's other factors that, um, that demonstrate that someone is going to become a customer. Those sort of drivers, the behaviors, the intents, what's, what are they doing online, offline, in their real life? Um, because you want to be there when they're ready to buy, mm -hmm. right? So, so we really look at it from that perspective. So the first thing we do is we try to find out what, the cus what our client knows about their existing customers. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes they have no clue. They come back and they're like, we don't know. You know? Have you ever got the answer where yeah. we sell to everybody? Yeah, we sell to everybody. But ev you, everybody, you can buy, everybody can buy what we have. Yeah. yeah, everybody can buy it. But when you drill down, you realize that that's not who is actually buying it. Right, because so, not, not, sorry, because like I always give the example, and I had read this, like Walmart, right? Not everybody, Walmart can sell to everybody, but they don't. Mm -hmm. They have a specific market. Target yeah. has a specific market. A Morton Steakhouse has a different market than a um, Outback. Yeah. Yeah. So it's getting to know your customers as well as possible. So, you know, whether it be surveying your customer, doing the typical, you know, data, there's always data that you can buy about your customers. But what we do, we actually, for our customers, especially when they come to us and, and we either we don't believe what they, what they think um, or we realize that they just don't, they don't know, is we'll do an analysis of their customers. So they can actually send us their customer list. Excuse me. Bless you. They can send us a customer list, send us their best customers, the people that buy the most or buy their most expensive products or whatever it is, repeat buyers. Uh, identify who your best customer is, give us those customers. We do an analysis of those customers and we look at all kinds of data points, you know, not just the demographics, but what else are they buying? Where else are they shopping? All these types of things that will help identify who their ideal customer is and the behaviors and intents around that. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a really great way to build sort of that, that client profile and help them understand who their customer is. Interesting. And, and let me ask you a question. Uh, do you find it sometimes difficult for them to give you that data? Like, yeah, I mean, yes, it, certainly some are, are more willing to, to do it than no, no, others. Not difficult in sharing it, difficult in even trying to access it, like to, to get it to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, always. Right. Um, but uh, the, the value that they get out of it is, is fantastic. So I think that, uh, you know, sometimes they don't, they don't even have that data. It's difficult for them to find. They don't know who their customers are versus who, you know, who their best customers are, or how much they've bought or anything like that. So, you know, yeah, there's a, there's a learning curve. Um, they have to, you know, they have to do some work sometimes to figure out who those people are to deliver to us. But, but yeah, once they do, they, they get a ton out of it. So it's, yeah, it's cool. interesting. Cause that's what we do. We teach, we train, um, well, we don't take the data, but we try to, we not try, but one of the number one pieces we like to start with is create what we call an ideal target profile or ideal target client. Mm -hmm. And it, it, um, there's, there's multiple categories in it. Also includes the different types of decision makers, right? Because we're more B two B, but I, I've seen that with the with all the podcasts I'm having with these entrepreneurs, it all started with the target, right? You're mm -hmm. solving a problem for a particular type of target, particular type of size, right? So don't try to be everything to everyone. Be mm -hmm. great at what you do and eat that market share, right? Yeah. Um, and um, any, any pointers for someone that, that to build that target prior to say going to you, right? Um, you know, so, so our topic is being able to do that. Any pointers that, I mean, obviously we, we'd want them to do business with you, but you know, for the entrepreneur that's out there that's saying, hey, you know, I, I can't, I, I hate when someone tells me, here's another hollow shoe, they said they know who they sell to. And then when you ask them, they can articulate it 
in detail. It's like the old create the avatar, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they say they know who their customer is, but when you ask them, they can't, yeah. they can't give you enough of, 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 they can't speak about it long enough. So what pointers would you give to someone to say, you know, this is what you should be doing to look for or to find or create a target uh, client or target uh, profile? Yeah. I mean, when you went to school and you were going to have a test, you studied, right? And the more you study, the better grade you got. So I think of it the same way. Um, you, your grade is, is your ability to sell and your customers are who you're selling to. So you need to study those customers. You need to know as much about them as possible. So, and there's so many ways to get to know your customers. I mean, there's so many tools, whether it be, you know, some, you know, tools for uh, surveying your customers. I mean, customers, you know, some customers are better at taking surveys than others. I think some of the best tools out there are the ones that ask a single question at a time rather than giving them a, a 10 page survey. Um, people I found that are, are really responsive to that one question. How did I do today? How did you like the product? Rate this one question, let them just be done with it. Um, but studying your, your best customers, I mean, really get to know them. Um, the better, you know, those, those customers, the, the more you're going to learn and the more you're, you know, you're better, you're going to be at finding more of them. And who would you say in the company should know who your best customers are? Well, definitely whoever's doing the selling to them without a doubt. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm one of the people that, I, for me, I always believe that everybody should know everything when it revolves around sales, right? Who's our target? Because mm -hmm. this way they can, they can be at a barbecue and they can say, well, what do you do? You know, and they'll, they'll say something that's another podcast, but at least they should be able to communicate who their target client is. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Regardless if they're in sales or not. Um, Great. So yeah, that's, good point. Point. that's a good point there. Um, and then what is, uh, what has been or is one of your biggest uh, challenges in sales? You know, for me and my company, I think we, it's one we're working on overcoming right now. Um, we we're in a big industry and we sell to very big companies, big brands, retailers, um, big agencies. And so for us, I think it's been getting past the hurdle of sort of being a younger company, right? Uh, I mean, we're five and a half years old, but you know, in, in, in an industry where we're dealing with, with, you know, giants, you know, they're often a little reluctant to go with somebody that's smaller and newer. Uh, so that's been our biggest challenge is, is, you know, proving to them that our size makes us more agile. It gives us, you know, the ability to move faster and change and grow and keeps us at the edge of technology. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that's been our biggest challenge. And some of the things that have helped that along the way is, you know, I think, being able to demonstrate how we, the value prop that we deliver to our customers, um, getting some recognition. And recently, uh, Forrester Research did a, a report on data marketplaces and uh, highlighted us as one of the top growth companies in, in the sure. industry. So Congratulations. It, thank you. Appreciate that. That's uh, that was a big uh, win for us. And I think that, you know, that's going to help us um, further demonstrate to those big brands that, that uh, were the, the company to, for them to work with. Interesting. And, and then also, how do you, uh, and you already answered my next question, how you're overcoming that, but, and what do you think are, uh, obviously any business and particularly your business, but any business is, is there to solve problems, right? So when you go into a company and prior to going in, what are their sales challenges? Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I think that, you know, we find that I would say that there's a, there's a general problem in sales and, in, uh, uh, that I've seen across the board and I'm guilty of it. I think we're all guilty of it at some point where we understand our business so well that 
we expect others to see it the way we see it, as clearly as we see it, the benefits and the value prop and all that stuff. Um, it's easy. You know, it's, it's obvious to us because we're in it. Uh, but I think the reality is it's not to others, right? So it often takes an outsider looking in to help analyze how that customer will perceive the company and its value proposition. And I think that, that that's something that a lot of companies don't realize. The sales leaders go in and think this is how we're going to you know, deliver our message. But without be, having an outsider looking in, you know, it's very easy to, to, to misinterpret how you're being, how company, how other companies are seeing you. Right. And, you know, it's funny, um, you know, us being in um, entrepreneurs organization that's throughout the world, but, you know, we have like 200 members. I could tell you this, that there are times that I know some of our, our peers for years and I still don't understand what they do. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a perfect example right there because they understand it so well that they're presenting it and saying, you know, this is who we are and this is what we do. But, you know, it just doesn't sound the same when it comes from them, whether it's as, as opposed to when it comes to a, a third party, somebody else is going to look at that company and be like, I still don't get what you do. Um, so, you know, it, it, I, I truly believe it's important to have someone else look at it and say, you know, help me figure out, you know, do you see what we do? Do you understand what we do from our messages? And if not, how do, you know, how do we switch it around so that, you know, everyone else can understand it as clearly as we do. Right. And the funny part is that um, what we do for companies is, is give them that elevator pitch, that 30 second to 60 second elevator pitch, you know, describing who their ideal client is, who, what kind of problems or challenges they're having and, and what kind of emotional feeling they're having about that problem. And then your, your UVP should be all about outcomes, right? Um, here are the outcomes by companies working with us. Here's what they've experienced in the outcome. That's your value proposition. Mm -hmm. Too many times people want to show up and throw up. And, and that 36, 30 second elevator pitch really is what you do, right? So mm -hmm. the problem is you'll see people, what do you do? I do, I'm, a, I'm an accountant. Well, that's not what you do, right? That's your profession, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm a lawyer. Well, that's not, you don't do lawyer, right? You make <laughs> law, but what kind of law? And then it's not just what kind of law. Okay. How are you helping people in what you do? Right? So a lawyer is, I keep people safe um, regarding any business transactions and protect them from um, entering into bad agreements and working with clients. We've been able to save them in making uh, a good decisions and keeping away from bad decisions, which therefore sold them, helped them in millions. Same thing with an accountant, same thing. I mean, just nice and short. Think about it. It's $5 million for a Super Bowl ad, mm -hmm. 30 seconds. Right. So, yep. so it's pretty interesting how I, I, we see that across the board is making sure you can communicate in 30 to 60 seconds. And, and that's really because we call that like your barbecue pitch or your, your outside pitch real quick and networking real quick to be able to say what you do, who you do it for and how, what you solve. Right. Um, and you'd be amazed at how little people are able to communicate that until you have in-depth conversations with them. Yep. Right. By then it's like, why didn't you tell me that? I referred someone to stay over here. Right. I would have rather sent them to you. Um, next question is, why do you think, and this is just a general question I like asking entrepreneurs because there's some studies out. Why do you think many companies um, that they are, oh wait, how, how many, oh, how many, why do you think so many companies spend so little time on investing in their sales leadership and management? And let me just qualify that is there, there's leadership, the ability to be, uh, uh, there's lots of books on leadership and there's lots of books on management. It's just sales leadership and sales management. There are some areas where there's parallels and there's some areas where there isn't, right? Or there aren't parallels, right? Because you're dealing with salespeople are needy, have big egos, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a sales professional. This is what I do for a living. And I deal with multiple uh uh, mentality, psychology, coaching. You have to be the person between your salespeople happy and the executive team being happy. So what, 
the sales management is, is, has the least amount of money spent on them regarding their development. And the sad part is, is that they usually promote the best salesperson to sales manager. Yeah. And yet you give them no management training from a sales perspective. So why do you think they spend so, they don't spend money on developing them and they should be developing them themselves, but just in general. Yeah. I mean, you just gave the typical example of the, of the mistake that companies make you know, when they, uh, uh, when they promote, right? They take the best sales guy and go, Oh, this guy's the best sales guy. He's done so well. Let's make him the manager. And they don't, they feel like he doesn't need any training because Hey, he's, he's the best sales guy. So he should help be able to help all the other salespeople sell. Um, it's a, it's a perfect example of having, you know, um, really the wrong person in the seat. Right. Uh, we always talk about putting, finding the right people for the right seats. And just cause somebody's a great salesperson doesn't mean they're going to be a great manager. Um, and in fact, it, it often is, is not the case. Um, and I, I just think it's just comes down to simply, um, most, most people just don't spend enough time to understand that. You know, I think in, in EO, we've, we've been exposed to enough, uh, presentations, um, where we've had the opportunity to learn, you know, how to, you know, find the right people for the right seat and how important that is, um, and I don't think that goes on in a lot of um, corporate structures. And you know, the typical corporate structure is working your way up the ladder, right? So you're constantly moving people into different seats that are not necessarily the right position for them. Um, and so I think the sort of corporate environment has uh, created a culture that you know, makes that common mistake over and over and over again. Well, that's why they're uh, turnover, right? I mean, yeah, in sales, you, you know, I was reading something, the average lifetime of a VP of sales is like 18 months. And, and then what they state is everything, all the great stuff that the VP of sales has implemented and put in, does, they don't see it to fruition because he's no longer there to move it through and they hire someone else, yeah. right? And, and you just made a great statement. Um, again, that's why this is the ugly truth, right? About hollow statements where everyone goes, yeah, find the right people, put the right people on the bus, good to great, this is what we do. Good. And they don't, right. they, put, they put the wrong salesperson in the wrong role. It's no different in, in sports, right? You can't, you can't put a, uh, a alignment to be a, a defensive back. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, they're just, everyone has to have the right role and you have to know how to identify that. So, and then the, um, their ability to train and manage in sales is, is just, I lectured at a couple MBA classes or it was a lab lecture in sales. And it's amazing how some of the textbooks are really good, but then they cut off. Right. And their, their hiring ability, their management ability is like a subsection of an entire textbook. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's amazing. Um, and how they groom their people. And then money spent high up on leadership, but you got to get there and you know, you're going to yeah. be the rare ones that go up to the top. You're just going to be turning over. Um, totally. Okay. So then how many companies uh, do you think have client targeting, right? Or, 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 or targeting, yeah, client targeting or creating ideal target profiles as part of their sales strategic plan? Um, you know, my guess is that, that many do. I just think that the way that they go about it can always be improved, but I think very few are constantly improving the process. Interesting. And I that, found very few. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I run into a lot of people that, that sort of think that they know who their, who their target client is, but I, what I, don't, I, I don't ever see them sort of improving that. And, and, you know, continuously trying to understand that. And, and that, is, I think, to me, is a, is a huge mistake because that changes constantly. Right. And also, you deal with very large companies. My, you know, our target is small to medium-sized companies. Mm -hmm. Anywhere from five to 100 million, that's it. As you start getting with those large retailers, they've been doing it for so long. They have data. It's just using a company like yours, they can, again, get a better return on investment because they're just throwing dollars at numbers. And hopefully those numbers are gonna calculate into the return that they're looking for. 
yeah. right? Um, but but we'll I think with the big with the big brands that and retailers that we work with, it's like they when they create the brand, they're like, okay, this is our target client. This is who we're going to reach, and that becomes their their plan, and they stick with it, and they stick with it for a long time, and you know, thing you know the trends change, right? And if they're not changing with those trends, I just saw. You know, I don't know anything about this brand, but I remember just seeing Forever 21 just went bankrupt or whatever. And while I know nothing about the brand, I, the name sounds familiar to me. And, and I know that it's a clothing store or whatever, but, you know, I've seen this before. It's, it's probably a typical situation where they, they had a target market and when they launched, you know, whatever it was 10, 15 years ago, that was their target market. But, you know, trends change, the, you know, new generation comes along and they're not fitting the trend and they're not fitting the generation. So they haven't, you know, improved on their processes and they haven't uh, uh, improved on identifying their client target and disappear. No, no. I, and, and the thing mm -hmm. is that this is great because you deal with very large companies, but imagine the smaller, small to medium sized companies, how little they do that. Mo most of them may have a business plan, but they don't have a sales strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Right, that's carved out on um, processes, on uh, uh, accountability, using CRMs. You know, those are the kind of pieces that you know. A lot of them don't want to be corporate. And I'm not saying that you need to be corporate, but there's a lot of good corporate practices that if you put into place in an entrepreneurial company, you will reap the rewards of that. Sure. Yeah. Right? Because you know Definitely. they're not big because they're not smart. They're big because they're smart. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And, yep. and then, and then the, sad, the hard part with companies that are really big is that they can afford to just waste dollars, right? They yeah. can, you know, uh, they lose a million, two million. I mean, Walgreens is one of those good to great companies. I love Walgreens, um, except for they still sell cigarettes. So now I go to CVS. But yeah. um, the thing with Walgreens is they'll, they'll close. I don't know if you know this, it's very good to great. They will close a, yeah. a Walgreens that is in the middle of, um, it's not on a corner, it's in the middle, and close it at, at a, even if it's profitable, at a cost of a million dollars to move it to a spot that now has a corner spot, mm -hmm. right? And that's talking about knowing their customers, yeah. right? And then they right. did so many different changes they did, but it was, it's very interesting and constantly advancing. And I see that now with, with companies that, you know, doing two, 300 million and they're not adapting. And then another company, 10 years of age has already caught them in sales. Yeah. Right. That's um, right. and, uh, let's go. So the, uh, one of the pieces I always like asking what is the last book or what is the book you're reading today? So I just finished a book called Flip the Script by Oren Clough. Uh, just told me that. Yeah, it's a great book. Uh, I really like this one. Actually, I like it a lot more than his last book. His, uh, I think the concepts he shares uh, are things that anyone can do. Um, Whereas his first book, uh, Pitch Anything, uh, was definitely full of concepts that only someone with a very high ego personality could, could attempt. Um, but Flip the Script is a really interesting uh, way it's a, it's about sales techniques. Um, it's sort of uh, more uh, takes advantage of more psychological sales techniques, which is really interesting. Um, I liked it. I'm I'm about to read it again. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so I just finished it and about to read it again because uh, I like to absorb it. Yeah, I um I usually buy um, the the Kindle and the audio version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm. A, I say read, but that means listen. So I, I'm an yes, audible. Yeah. Me that's reading, you're learning, right? But I yeah. actually get the book and the audio version because I want to highlight. And sometimes I found they're a bridge. So what I'm listening to. So for example, I've gone through three or four times um, the key uh, key person of influence from the from Kevin uh, Kevin Harrington. Remember? Yep, the yep, yep. Excellent, mm -hmm. I mean, excellent, excellent. It's taught me a lot. It talks about present uh, your pitch. Mm -hmm. really strong on the pitch. Yep. So that may be a good section to you to read. But then I noticed that um, when I'm listening to and in the book is a little bit more in depth. So I go back and, and forth. And, and that's a book I'm still reading. I find myself um, reading books several times to be able to execute on, them, right? Because yep. you're not going to remember everything you have. I, um, I agree. So David, tell us a little bit. You told us some 
and, and we got a good understanding. But let's break this down for, for our listeners at BDAX. You know, tell us a little bit about your company um, and then tell us how you know, people can find you and reach your company or ask you questions on any of the social channels or your website, however you'd like to have them reach you out. Sure. I mean, yeah, real quick. Um, so BDEX uh, actually stands for Big Data Exchange. And uh, we are a data infrastructure company uh, that empowers what we call human connectivity. Um, we help B2C uh, brands, retailers, and agencies connect with people through the power of data, understanding their uh, behaviors and intents so that they can reach the right people at the right time. Um, so that's really what we do. Um, and, uh, you know, easy to reach us. Uh, we are at, uh, bdex.com. It's B-D-E-X.com. And, uh, you can always email me too, David at bdex.com. Oh, awesome. Well, you know, I really appreciate, uh, the time that you gave me, um, and gave us on the show. Probably like to have you back because it's interesting. I think, uh, uh Eric, um, uh, Rosenberg, I just, uh, we had a podcast and I think he's reading flip the script also. Yeah. He's my forum brother. Yep. He's reading, mm -hmm. he's reading flip the script. Yep. And, um, Cause I brought it up in forum last, last, uh, two weeks ago. Three that's weeks. funny. <laughs> so no wonder. Cause I mean, I heard it twice and then I recognized the last name cause it was a little bit different. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, but one thing I, I would like to do, uh, and our listeners, so they know is probably do like a four person, uh, 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 podcast have us like in the sports channel you know we're four of us in the corner uh, me you Eric and David Krieger because I'm, I'm, the one thing that I'm seeing that has started aligning even though we're in different sectors of sales right um, mm -hmm. or sales generation right that's what I call it right revenue generation um, yeah. commonality has been the target client mm -hmm. right Pre yep. Your preparation, the target client. How do you know who's your client that's a good fit for you? You know, um, Eric has a particular fit for him, a certain size, right? Mm -hmm. uh, David has a particular fit for, it's, it's not just for, he has a particular fit for his company, but he's like you. He finds a particular fit for his own clients. Yeah. Right? Yep. And you're finding you have a particular target for your company, and then your company has to help your client find their target. That's exactly is that, right. Is that, fair, is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. So, um, thank you again. And, uh, thank you for, uh, listening again to the ugly truth about sales of where we take those uh, false or hollow statements and help you execute on them. And, and just let you know that when you're sitting around a table, not every business person, they're going to make these great statements and they're going to sound smart, but then they'll go back to their businesses and they just won't execute on. It. So, you know, without executing on a great idea, it's just worthless, right? Um, again, uh, this is the ugly truth about sales. Please subscribe to our channel. Um, you could reach me again at victorrocho.com. This video will be on both Vimeo and Victor TV. It'll be on YouTube as well. It'll be shared with David and, and BDX. And a quick shout out since we got all the yo on. This is for uh, Stein Posner, Century 21. This is uh, his cup. It's a great cup, but they're a real estate company. He's one of our EO brothers. Since I'm drinking a cup out, I'll throw it out of there. Uh, yeah. David, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this. And um, I, I wish you nothing but the best. And I, and I, I love what you do. Awesome. Thank you. It's uh, been a pleasure. Thank you, Victor. All right. Thank you. You have a All great right. day. You too.